Hi everyone, welcome back to Art of the Part. In this video, we're going to continue on with our bracket exercise case study, and we're going to take a look at advanced revision management inside of Mastercam using P2 and P3. So in the last video, we looked at basic revision management going from P1 to P2, and there's a handful of principles that we'll be referencing from that video in this video. So if you have any questions or concerns with what we're covering, just go back and watch that video before proceeding on with this one. So as we're looking at advanced revision management here in Mastercam going from P2 to P3, the first thing that I'm going to do again is just to follow this exact same workflow, we're going to take a look at our blueprints, which I already have open for P2 and P3. So looking at the bracket exercise P2 blueprint, you can see here we have bracket exercise P2 in the bottom right hand corner in our title block. And up here in the top right hand corner, we do have our revision table and we are currently at revision B and we've added ribs for strength per testing. So if you look at the top view of the blueprint, we currently have this bracket exercise 3D model and we have this call out here in B that is calling out these two ribs that we've added for strength per testing. Now again, we found out using SOLIDWORKS simulation and FEA studies that this particular revision would not withhold the intended load rating. So that eventually led us to uh, create or redesign this for bracket exercise P3. So we're gonna take a look at this bracket exercise P3 uh, blueprint here. And again, if you look in the bottom right hand corner, we have our title block, we have bracket exercise P3. And then up here in the top right hand corner, we do have this revision table. And now we have three re uh, revisions going from A, B, and then eventually here to C. So C is calling out that we've updated the datum A for part symmetry. So this is going to be quite different from the relationship from P1 to P2, where we really just changed uh, some of the internal geometry here. But now when we're going from P2 to P3, we're actually updating where the datum or the origin of the part is. And the reason why we're doing this is because we're trying to put this datum A right down the middle of the part so that we can maintain symmetry from the top side to the bottom side. And again, the reasoning why we're doing this, especially if you're looking at this part inside of SOLIDWORKS, is because we can use this datum A plane as a mirror plane to take all of the geometry from the top side and then just mirror it over to the bottom side. However, this is going to start to cause some issues when we bring in this new revision for the bracket exercise P3 into our master cam session, because we've effectively changed or moved the origin from where it was originally located. So if you look back at the blueprint for the bracket exercise P2, and if you wanted to, you can take a look at the bracket exercise P1 as well, but the datum A is actually located at the bottom side of the part, and we were able to share those origins going from P1 to P2. So we went to go to file, merge in, and we pulled both of those files in, we were able to just drop them on top of each other. Now we're going to have to do a little bit of extra work with the translation because now if we look at this P3 revision, we've effectively updated or changed that origin. Now, there were some additional changes that happened going from P2 to P3, and I want to take a moment to talk about those. So obviously we have the symmetry update, and that's also being called out here by this symmetry GDNT callout. And that means that everything that we see here on this top view, so we have three pockets, should also be mirrored over to the back side, so we should have an additional three pockets on this side. Likewise, there are some radii that have been placed at the bottom surface of each one of these pockets, as well as the top surface of each one of these steps. So we can see from the cross-section view that there's a typical radius callout for 0.063, which are gonna be all of our floor radii, which are gonna be in the bottom of all these pockets, and again, at the top of each one of these steps. So that being said, we probably have to start to reconsider what tools we're gonna to be using as we're trying to rough and finish these details out. So let's go ahead and back out of these blueprints and just take a look at our master cam file for where we left off on in P2. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna to try to follow a very similar workflow as what we covered in the basic revision management video going from P1 to P2. So I'm gonna move through these first couple of steps a little bit quicker. If you have any questions, just watch that previous video. But I'm gonna start off this advanced revision management going from P2 to P3 by toggling off the visibility of where we left off on in P2. So in the left-hand side in our operations manager, I'm going to select my second operation. My view is currently being obstructed by this stock model. So I'm going to toggle the visibility off with these four little waves. It's the second icon on that second row. We're gonna turn that off. And then I'm going to go over to the bottom of my tabs here. I'm gonna click on the planes tab and I'm going to reorientate myself to the first op top. So I'm gonna change my WCS, my C and my T. And then I'm gonna move out here into my viewport. I'm going to right click and from the drop down menu, I will change this to the isometric view. 
Likewise, I'm going to move down into my Levels tab, and inside of Levels, I'm just going to turn off my Work Holding Level because it's currently obstructing my view, so I really can't see what revision that I'm working on. So I'm going to click on the Work Holding Level here. There's a visible column. I'm just going to click on that X, and that's going to turn off my Work Holding. And then I'm just going to zoom in here to my current 3D model, and I'll just shift this up. And just like what we did before, we're gonna add a new level here for the P3 revision. So I'll move over here to the left-hand side in my Levels tab, and I'm going to click on the green plus button at the top left of the window. So I'll click on Add a New Level, and we're just going to title this level P3. So I'll double-click on the Name column, and I'm going to title this P3. And just like what we did before, we just wanna make sure that we have a check mark on this P3 level, and we're just going to merge in this new revision for the bracket exercise P3. So in the top left-hand corner, we're gonna click on the File, and from the drop down menu here, we're going to find the merge command. So click on merge, and then we're just going to try to redirect ourselves to wherever we have our P3 revision. And then I'm going to locate my bracket exercise P3. We'll click on that. And from the bottom right hand corner here, I'm going to click on open. Now again, we just want to make sure whenever we're pulling in a new uh, component into our Mastercam session, we just want to make sure that our levels are currently set to the active level. So once you have active level selected, we can start to take a look at our bracket exercise P3 and how that's being merged or imported into our session of Mastercam. So as we made mention earlier, we found out that the origin or the datum has been changed from P2 to P3. And we can clearly see that with how this is being merged or imported in because that new bracket exercise P3 model is now being imported below the origin location that we were using for P1 and P2. Now, one thing that I want to investigate before we start to move this model around is if any of the critical dimensions have changed going from P2 to P3. So I'm going to take a look at those blueprints, just like what we were doing before. And we can see here, I'm going to call it a couple of critical dimensions. When we're looking at bracket exercise P2, we do have an outside contour arc of two inches. The distance between each one of these bottom holes is two inches, as well as the distance from the bottom hole to the top hole is two inches. And then we have a total height of the part of 0.62. So as we go from P2 to P3, we can see that none of those critical dimensions have really changed or been updated. The only thing that we're changing or revising is actually the internal geometry of this component, as well as the symmetry that we're applying from the top side to the bottom side. As far as the overall footprint and the critical dimensions of how this part might fit into some of our soft jaws, nothing has really changed. We still have this outside contour arc of two inches, the distance between the bottom holes is two inches, and then the distance from the top hole to the bottom hole is two inches, and even the overall height of the part is 0.625. So in theory, we should be able to take the bracket exercise P3 and link or lock this top edge to the top edge of P2, and then your face mill as well as your outside contours for roughing and finishing should match up exactly. So I'm going to go ahead and move back over here into Mastercam, and again, there's two ways that we can go about doing this. One, we could take this entire model and move it from this top face for P3 to the top face of P2. Or, and I'm gonna do this as a bad example, but let's say for instance that the critical dimensions have changed. Let's say the overall height of the part went from 0.625 to 0.75. How are we going to center this with our existing stock geometry? So an easy way to do this is if we take the dynamic command, so again, we're gonna click on dynamic, and we're just going to reference the center datum of this bracket exercise P3. So wherever that origin is located on this model. I'm gonna click on that origin or that datum location from the bracket exercise P3. And then instead of clicking on this gray ball, I'm actually just going to click on the Z stem. So I'll click on this Z stem here. And this is going to allow me to dynamically move the bracket exercise P3 and Z. So I can move this up or down as I wish. Likewise, I have this ruler to the left of my mouse that's going to allow me to move this incrementally by 60 thousandths. However, I'm actually just trying to position this in between the top and the bottom face of our stock material, so this is exactly center. So this is actually relatively easy to do. I'm just going to move my mouse out here to one of the top corners of my stock material. I'm going to leave my mouse there. I'm not going to click, but once I have my mouse there, it's going to try to wake up one of those corners and it's going to give me a green plus button. I'm going to do the exact same thing to the bottom corner. So I'm gonna move my mouse down here to the bottom corner and I'm gonna leave it there until I see that green plus button. And once both of those corners are woken up, I can find the midpoint between both of those selections. So there's going to be a red plus button in between both of those. That's going to be your midpoint selection. And we're just trying to link the center point or the datum or the origin of this bracket exercise P3 to the midpoint of both of these selections. So I'm gonna click on this red plus button right here and that's going to 
center this part in the middle of our stock material. So again, this is a bad example. If we ever had to go through a design change for one of those critical dimensions where the part went from 0.625 to 0.75, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of the fact that we can just take this top base and link it from P2 to P3. You would probably have to center this in between the stock model. So let's go ahead and hit the green check mark and apply this dynamic move. So we'll hit the green check mark and then we'll just hit the green check mark one last time. And again, I don't know why this occurs, but this is just a little glitch inside of Mastercam where it creates this extra level for us. So I'm just going to right click on that new level that got created and then I'm just going to go ahead and clear the empty level from the drop down menu and I'll just select the selected option. Now, just like I was showing you in the last video, I like to toggle on and off these new revisions that we're pulling in just to get a better idea visually in case I missed anything on the blueprints. So on the left hand side, we are currently on the fifth level for P3. And since this check mark is on this level, no matter what I do to this visibility column, I can't turn on or off the visibility for P3. So I will have to change my current level to something else like the wireframe stock. So I'm gonna put this check mark next to the second level for wireframe stock. And this will allow me to toggle on or off the visibility for P3. So I can click on this X in the visibility column for P3. I'm gonna pull myself back to the P2 revision. And I can clearly see that we have these deep pockets as well as we're missing all these floor radii in the bottom of the pocket as well as the top edges of these steps here. However, if I change myself back over to P3 and I toggle off P2, I can see that the pockets have been shallowed out. We now have floor radii in the bottom of those pockets and we have floor radii on the top of those edges for that step. Additionally, if I toggle on and off the P2 level, I can clearly see that the critical dimensions or the overall footprint from P2 to P3 has not changed, even after we moved it up to that top surface. So in my mind, I'm thinking that I can probably keep some of these tool paths that we're using in P2. So for example, that top base mill, as well as the roughing and the finishing for that outside contour. So let's just make sure that our P2 level is currently turned off and that we only have P3 on. So I'm going to move down here into our toolpaths tab and then we're just going to cycle through our toolpaths to see what we can keep or what needs to be updated and changed. So we're going to start off here by looking at our first operation toolpath group and we currently have a face mill here at the top of that first operation so let's go ahead and click on that face mill right there and as we've already identified in previous steps the top surface going from P2 to P3 is exactly the same because we were able to maintain that overall height or that critical dimension of 0.625 all we needed to do when we merged in that P3 revision was we had to shift it up in Z. So in my opinion, this face mill is still valid. It's still good coming from P2 to P3. So we don't have to make any changes there. And honestly, the same can be said for the second and the third toolpaths, which are going to be roughing and finishing toolpaths for the outside contour of this model. So again, we looked at the blueprint. We didn't make any changes to the overall footprint. So in my opinion, uh, the first, second, and the third toolpaths are still valid. They're still good, and we don't have to make any changes. However, when we start to get in the fourth toolpath, this is where we start to run into some trouble. So we can clearly see that this toolpath is traveling inside of the model and that we're below the top surface or this first step from the P3 revision. Now this toolpath isn't necessarily wrong, it's just that it's still linked to the top surface from P2. So if we didn't want to delete this toolpath and reassociate all this geometry, all we would really need to do is just update the Z depth value so that it's in line with the top surface of P3. But before we can do that and update this toolpath, we still have to address one other issue, which is actually going to be these floor radii as they run off of the top surface here of this first step. And right now we're using a 5 8 flat end mill to rough out this step from P2. And if I look at this fourth toolpath and I open or expand this out, I can see that 5 8 flat end mill right there. I'm going to double click on this to open up the edit tool window. I'm not going to make any changes, but I am going to show you what this graphic looks like. So this is where the flat end mill or the square end mill comes from. It's just that we have a flat uh, bottom right here and that we have sharp corners on either side. And if I tried to use this tool to cut into this radius, I would actually overcut it and I would create a sharp edge in these corners. So what we need to do is choose a different tool so that we can project a radius in these corners while still maintaining this flat surface. So I'm actually going to back out of this edit tool window. Again, I didn't make any changes and I'm going to open up a document that we cover in class. 
So this is just a quick selection of tools that we could use for milling operations. Obviously, there's a lot more tools out there. So this is more or less just a basic introduction of tools that we have been using or that we could be using. So you should be pretty familiar with face mills, flat end mills, chamfer mills, and twist drills. So if we look at those tools, you can actually see a 3D representation of how that tool would project. So for example, if we're looking at this flat end mill, which is what we're using for this first step going from P2 to P3, uh, would actually create a, a flat surface at the bottom, but then a sharp edge in the corner. And that's really great. We were using that for that P2 revision. We didn't have a radius there before, but now that we want to project a radius in that corner, we really only have two options. And that's either going to be a bull nose end mill or a ball nose end mill. And I'm just going to take a moment to talk about these tools and why they're used. So if we're looking at the ball nose end mill, this is much like the flat or the square end mill. However, we don't have a flat bottom. And then we actually replace that with a complete tangent arc from one edge to the other. So this is more or less a spherical tool and it's used for surfacing out complex geometry. One thing that you have to keep in mind while using a ball nose end mill is that you're going to have these high points or what we call scallops going from one tool path to another tool path. Because of the spherical nature of the tool, you're never going to be able to create a flat edge because the tangent high point would just be running over itself over and over and over again. And we do have to step over that tool. So you're going to have these slight or small scallops as you move the tool over and you're going to be able to control those with your step over rate or your step over percentage. So in this instance, we probably wouldn't want to use that ball nose end mill because we still want to maintain a flat surface on that top edge. So in this specific instance, we're probably going to want to utilize the bull nose end mill. And this is more or less the best of both worlds where we can take the spherical nature of the ball nose end mill and combine it with the flat surface of the flat end mill. So the bull nose end mill has a flat surface and then it has small radii in the corner that we can project that radius for when we're cutting. So you can see here, this is an example of profiling where we have a flat surface and then a radius in the corner instead of a sharp edge. So let's jump back into Mastercam and investigate what size those floor radii are and that's going to help us determine what size bull nose end mill we need to use. So I'm just going to minimize this document and return back to our bracket exercise P3 in Mastercam and again you can clearly see that we have floor radii on this top step as well as floor radii in the bottom of these pockets. So if I wanted to, I could always go back and look at the blueprint, and if my memory serves correct, the typical value of these floor radii should be 0 0.0625. However, if you don't have access to your blueprint, and maybe you just want to investigate what those values are inside the 3D model, you can easily do that. You just want to make sure you're here inside the Home tab inside of Mastercam. And then we're just going to move over here, and we've used the Analyze Entity before, as well as Analyze Distance, but we're going to take this one step further and actually use this Dynamic Analyze. So if you click on this dynamic analyze, it's going to allow us to investigate or get values of 3D geometry. So for instance, this radius right here for the floor, I can click on that and it's going to give me this analyze dynamic window and I can clearly see that the radius has a value of 0 0.0625 and that would equate out to a full diameter value of 0.125. And then I'll also check what the floor radius value is inside of these pockets. So again, I can come up back up here to the dynamic option, click on dynamic, and then I'm just going to select on one of these floor radii. And this is going to, again, give me a value of 0 0.0625 for the radius, and then a full diameter value of 0.125. So in my mind, I have to use at least a tool that has a 0 0.0625 radius in the corner if I want to finish, and then it has to be bigger than 0 0.0625 if I want to rough out. So if we want to look back at our tool library from what we imported way back when, when we were trying to program P1, I have this Excel sheet that you can access, and I even have some of this detail listed out here for what the radius or the tip would be. So in column G, I'm just going to highlight or select that, and we're going to scroll all the way down here, and I have an entire selection of tools that have radii in the corner, whether they be bullnose end mills or ballnose end mills. And we can see here we have a half inch bullnose end mill that has a corner radius of 0 0.0938. So that might be really good for a roughing operation. And then I have a 250 bullnose end mill that has a corner radius of 0 0.0625, which is exactly what we want to be using for a finishing operation. So in my opinion, I think our strategy is going to be to use this half inch bullnose end mill, so the 13th tool for roughing, and then to use the 14th tool, which is the 250 bullnose end mill for finishing. 
So let's go ahead and see um, how those would project as we update this toolpath. So I'm going to minimize this window here for our tool library. I'm going to go back up here into my fourth toolpath, which is going to be this roughing operation for the first step. I'm going to open or expand that out and then open up the parameters tab here. And then we said before, we're just going to try to update the tool and then we have to update the depth. So we're going to update the tool first. We'll click on the tool right here. And then instead of using the 5 8 flat end mill, I'm actually going to scroll down here and find the 14th or sorry the 13th tool which is going to be the half inch bull nose end mill so again that 13th tool right there we'll select on that and then whenever you're changing tools inside of an operation you must always right click on the tool that you want to change to and then reinitialize the speeds and speeds from the drop down menu so if we reinitialize the feeds and speeds it's going to update your speeds and feeds here and then we also have to update our note so this is a 5 8 flat end mill I'm just going to retitle this as 0.500 uh, bull nose, end mill, and this is going to be a rough step. Now again, we have to also update the depth so that we're no longer cutting inside the part and that we're going up to the top surface of that P3 step. So I'm going to come down here into my linking parameters. Inside of linking parameters, top of stock still is zero. However, we are going to update the depth here. It was going down a negative value of 0.125. So we're going to click on this depth here and we're going to reassociate this with the top edge of this new step from P3. And we can see that that value got updated to a negative value of 0 0.0625. So we've updated the tool, we've updated the step. Let's see how this updates when we hit the green check mark when we uh, regenerate this tool path. And from first glance, that actually looks pretty good. So we were able to raise that tool path out from the middle of the model and we're here at the top of the first step. And I just wanna see what this looks like and verify. So let's just go ahead and double check tool paths one, two, three, and now four and see how that runs. So I'm gonna select on the first tool path here. I'm gonna hold down the shift key and I'm gonna select on the fourth tool path. And you should see a check mark next to each one of those toolpaths. And just like we've done before, we're just going to run this and verify. It's the half pipe looking icon here in the top row uh, above the operations manager. So click on verify right there. This is going to open up our verify window. And again, there's an importance of separating your uh, levels so that we can turn on or off the fixtures here. So I'm going to turn off my fixtures and then I'm gonna return back to my model. I will change the stock so that's the only thing I can see and then turn off my workpiece and then make sure here and verify that we have color loop activated. And let's play this out and see what happens. So I'll slow this down as well and play that out. So we have a face mill, we have our roughing and finishing for that outside contour. And then really quickly, I just wanna show you this. I'm gonna step this back a couple tool paths. And you can see that as we project this tool into the corners here, we're getting this nice radius value. And that's because we're using this bull nose end mill that has a flat surface and then that 0 0.0938 eight radius in the corner. So that's the half inch bull nose end mill. And this would more or less be a roughing operation because we aren't going to get to that finished uh, size of 0 0.0625. But we can see that we no longer have that sharp edge in the corner from the flat end mill and that the bull nose end mill is creating this radius here. So I'm going to let that play out. I'll finish that up. And we have avoided all these uh, extruded diameters. And again, this looks really great to me. So I think we can go ahead and move on into the finishing operation and just use that 14th tool, which is going to be the quarter inch bull nose end mill with a corner radius of 0 0.0625. So let's go ahead and back out of verify here. And again, we're just gonna step down and cycle through these toolpaths. I'm gonna to look at this next toolpath, which is going to be our fifth toolpath for a finishing operation of that first step. So I'll click on that fifth toolpath. Again, we can see that the toolpath is running inside of the model. It's below that top surface or that first step. So we're not only gonna to have to update the tool, but we're also going to have to update um, where the depth is going to be located. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up this fifth toolpath. I'll expand that out with the plus button here. I'm gonna click on the parameters and inside the parameters, we're just gonna go ahead and select on the tool. Inside a tool, we were using that 5 8 flat end mill before, so we are going to update that and change it to that 14 tool that we were talking about, which is going to be the quarter inch bull nose end mill. So we'll select on that 14 tool right there. As always, whenever we change a tool, we have to right click on it, and from the drop down menu, we have to reinitialize the feeds and speeds so that we can update those values. Likewise, we have to update our note. We were saying that this was a 5 8 flat end mill. I will now say that this is a 0.250 or a quarter inch bullnose end mill. 
And again, this is going to be a finished step. So we're just gonna jump down here into our linking parameters. As we updated in the previous step, uh, we had to change the depth from point or negative point 0.125. Uh, we're gonna update that to that negative point 0.0625 value to the top step of the uh, P3 model. So I'm gonna click on depth here. And now we're just gonna click on one of these top edges and then we'll hit the green check mark to regenerate this toolpath. And again, we can see that the toolpath is looking pretty good. We are no longer inside the model. And now since we're using a smaller tool, we will have more toolpath offsets, but that shouldn't be a problem. So I'm actually gonna move over here into my operations manager and I'm going to use the red arrow as a placeholder to let myself know what toolpaths I have updated. So we updated um, the fourth toolpath and we kept one, two, and three. I'm just going to move this red arrow one down beneath the fifth toolpath and then I'll run toolpaths one through five and verify. So again, I'm just gonna come up here into my operations manager. I'm going to move the red arrow down once to uh, signify that I have updated toolpaths four and five, and then I still have to look at six and seven. So I'm going to highlight or select uh, the first toolpath, hold down the shift key, and then also select up to the fifth toolpath so that I have all toolpaths from one through five selected. And then once again, we'll run this and verify using the half pipe looking icon in the top row of our operations operations manager, and this will open up verify for us. And this time I will actually turn on my workpiece to see how this looks against the final or the finished model. So I'm actually going to toggle my uh, transparency for the stock model, and then I'm going to turn on my workpiece, and we'll let this play out to see if this uh, quarter inch bullnose end mill is going to finish those corner radii to the correct value. So here we're at using the quarter inch uh, bull nose end mill, and then I'm actually going to turn off my tool here so I can see, and again, look at that. We have a one-to-one -one relationship of how that corner radius should be projected into that corner. We no longer have that sharp edge, and we're using the 62 thousandths radius from the bull nose end mill to project that radius there in the corner. So this looks really great to me, and we can start to move on into the pocket details, so we have to rough and finish that out as well. So I'll shift that around and then I'll exit out of verify and return back to my Mastercam model. So since those tools worked out pretty great for us where we're roughing using a half inch bullnose end mill and finishing using a quarter inch bullnose end mill, let's see if we can replicate that workflow for the sixth and the seventh toolpath, which are going to be our roughing and finishing operations for these pockets here in the center of our part. So I'm gonna move over here into my operations manager and click on our sixth toolpath. And again, this is going to be a roughing operation here for these pockets in the middle of our part. And as we saw when we were toggling the visibility between P2 and P3, the pockets in P2 were much deeper than the pockets in P3. So we are going to have to come back and update these depth values in Z. So let's just keep that in the back of our mind. So again, I'm just gonna move over here into my operations manager. I'm going to open or expand out the six tool path, and then I'm going to double click on the parameters to open up my parameters window. Now, I'm gonna use this toolpath as an opportunity to talk about a bad example. So if we look at the chain geometry here inside the toolpath type tab, this is all still currently linked to the old P2 revision. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing because as we identified from the blueprints going from P2 to P3, we didn't really make any changes to the overall footprint and these pocket sizes are exactly the same. So in theory, we don't have to make any changes here, but what would happen if going from P2 to P3, we had to change the angle of these ribs or maybe these pockets had to get updated in their size what would we have to do because when we selected the automatic region here from p2 we selected the entire bottom face of this pocket but now this bottom face is being interrupted by these floor radii so what would we have to do i'm actually going to deselect this uh, selection here for automatic regions we're just going to click on this mouse button with a circle and a cross through it to turn off or deselect this selection so i'm going to deselect this right now and then I'm going to re-pick this or re-associate uh, it with this P3 uh, geometry. So I'm going to click on this uh, mouse button right here for automatic regions. And this is where we start to get into trouble when we use automatic region. Because currently, if we're using the solid chaining option, our only option to pick from is these faces. So if I try to pick this face down here, well, I'm actually going to be 60 thousandths offset from the, uh, the walls because we have this floor radii interrupting that surface. So what we would need to do is actually change this back over to wireframe and try to pick wireframe geometry. 
but we don't have any wireframe geometry unless we project it from this pocket right here. And that's actually going to be a little bit more work than what we're looking for. So I'm actually going to hit X here and try to return back to my toolpath type. And this would eliminate us from using the automatic region. We would actually have to go back to our bread and butter and use the machining region option. And this is why I show you how to use that machining region because this is the tried and true method. You're always going to get the result that you want. So we're going to click on the uh, select machining chains here for the machining region. And now we have the ability to go back into the solid chaining. And instead of only being able to choose faces, I'm going to deselect faces. And I'm actually going to deselect the entire loop. And I'm only going to select the edges. So using this edge selection, I'm going to use the top edge of this entire radius going around the pocket. So in theory, if you click this once, it's only going to pick one edge. However, if you hold down the shift key and you click on this edge, it's going to select the entire tangent chain. And I just want to make sure before I select this, I want to have this going counterclockwise because we're again, we're inside of an internal pocket and everything is going to be reversed if we're trying to do climb cutting. So we're going to select this inside pocket chain going counterclockwise. I'm going to hold down the shift key on my keyboard and I'm going to click somewhere up here so that my arrow is going to go counterclockwise. So I'm going to click on this top edge here and you can see that we're getting a nice counterclockwise chain going around that pocket. We're going to follow suit with the two smaller pockets so I'm going to go counterclockwise once again. I'm going to click on this pocket and then I'm also going to click on this pocket. So again I'm selecting that top edge of that radius so that I can get the entire extents of that pocket wall. So this looks like a great selection to me. I'm going to hit the green check mark now. And in theory, we wouldn't have to make any other changes here inside of the toolpath type selection because our machining region strategy is still currently set to stay inside. So we're trying to stay inside that pocket selection. Likewise, we don't have any additional geometry to be considered for avoidance regions, so we wouldn't have to populate this avoidance regions right here. And again, I just showed this as a bad example. If we had to repick this geometry going from P2 to P3, if you still have the selections from P2, the overall extents of these pockets did not change, so you can still use that geometry. We just have to update the tool that we're using, as well as the top of the stock and the depth to be considered for this P3 revision. So let's go ahead and move down here into the tool tab, and inside that tool tab, we're currently using the 312 end mill or that 516 flat end mill and we're just going to update this and change it to the 13th tool which was going to be that half inch bull nose end mill. So I'm going to click on that half inch bull nose end mill and in theory it would be a good practice for us to right click and reinitialize the speeds and feeds and then also update the note but I have a sneaking suspicion that this half inch bull nose end mill is going to be a little bit too big to cut these smaller pockets here. So I'm not going to change my speeds and feeds and I'm also not going to change or update this note quite yet. I want to see if this toolpath is going to regenerate before I actually make those changes. So then I'm just going to move down here into my linking parameters. And as I said, this is all still linked to that old P2 revision. We have to update the top of stock as well as the depth. So let's go ahead and start with the top of stock. We'll click on top of stock right there. And we're just going to link this to this top level here. It should be about a negative 0 0.0625. So again, we're about 62 thousandths below that top surface. And the depth, this was way deep for that P2 revision. We're actually going to make that more shallow. So click on depth here and we'll click on one of these bottom edges here for the pocket and we can see that gets updated to negative 0.1875 or negative 3 sixteenths. So again let's hit the green check mark and see if this toolpath regenerates the way that we want it to with that half inch bull nose end mill. And as I suspected, I think that this tool is just a little bit too big for these smaller pockets. And no matter what I do to the entry motion, so if I go back into pr the parameters and I try to change this entry motion to a smaller value, I'm gonna go all the way down here to 0 0.03125 and I'll hit the green check mark and I'm still not gonna see the results that I want. It's still too big of a tool to cut these smaller pockets. So I'm gonna walk back in here into my parameters for that six tool path and we're gonna re-update this or relink that to the old tool that we were using which is going to be that 312 flat end mill. So we're going to find that fourth tool there. We'll re-update that to the 312 flat end mill. And we don't have to update or change the speeds and feeds now, and we can leave this note exactly the same. Now, something that we do need to consider is when we go down here into our cut parameters, the stock to leave on the walls and the floor is still only five thousandths. So if I left this as is, we would actually be overcutting into this radius as we're trying to only leave five thousandths on the wall and the floor. So I think a good rule of 
thumb, if you're trying to cut a detail that has a radius in the corner and that you're using a tool that has a flat or a sharp corner, you're gonna take the value of that radius and divide it by two and then use that value for both the stock to leave on the walls and the floor. And that should offset you in the middle of this radius. So we have a value of 0 0.0625 for this corner radius here. And we're just going to update this value divided by two, which should be 31,000. So I'm just gonna type in 0 0.03 125 to leave on the wall and then we'll do the exact same thing to leave stock on the floor so we're going to take that 0 0.0625 radius divided by 2 and that's going to give us a value of 0 0.03125 and what this is doing is we're trying to offset from the floor and the wall so that we're not going to overcut with a sharp tool as we're trying to rough out this radius detail. So this is going to put us in a pretty good location and we can go ahead and hit the green check mark and see what happens. So I'll hit the green check mark and this does look like it's giving us a good tool path and what we talked about in the last video as well, I'm not really a big fan of this entry ramp motion here where we're just heel-cling down and we're not cutting at a specific depth. So I am going to go back into the six tool path and then update that entry helix radius. So I'm gonna go back into the parameters and then inside the parameters, I'm gonna jump down here into entry motion and we have a value here of 0 0.140625. That in theory would still be a good value, but we're not getting the results that we want. So I'm just going to shrink this all the way down to 30 thousandths and see what happens. So I'm just gonna go 0 0.03125. I talked about this in the last video, but you can always step this up incrementally. Bigger is better when you're trying to use this helix radius, but in this instance, we're just trying to fit our tool inside of this small pocket. And I'll let the green check mark and see if this updates the way that we want to. And we can clearly see that we have that nice helix entry motion and we are getting that depth cup there in blue. So let's see what this looks like and verify. And again, I'm just gonna follow the same workflow that I was showing you before. I'm gonna move my red arrow down one toolpath because we completed the six toolpath for the roughing operation. And then I'm just going to use this as a way so that I can select the first toolpath, hold down the shift key, and then go all the way down to this new toolpath that we just updated for that six toolpath. And I'm gonna to select toolpaths one through six. So all of those have a check mark next to them. And then I'm going to verify this up here in the top of the operations manager. We're gonna click on this half pipe looking icon and then I'm going to see if this roughing operation is going to overcut into those radii of our uh, stock model here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play and we'll see how this is all uh, running out. I'm also going to turn on my tool again here and we can see that we have the uh, roughing and finishing operations for that first step and then now we're going to look at this roughing operation for these pockets. So it looks like um, as we zoom in here, again, we're not getting that overcut value because we were able to offset from the floor and the wall that 31 thousandths. So we're not going to intersect with that radius at all. And I'll just really quickly show you what that uh, looks like when we are going to overcut using a sharp tool. So I'm just going to back out of verify here. And then again, this is just a bad example. Do not do this on your end, but I'm gonna go back into my parameters. And let's say we're trying to get a little bit too close with our uh, stock to leave on the wall and the floor. And we do go back down to, let's even say, you know, 15 thousandths. And this is actually gonna be half of that 31 thousandths value that we were using. And if I regenerate this, and I'm gonna select the first tool path all the way down here to the sixth tool path, and then rerun this and verify, I will actually probably see this is going to overcut into that radius. And you'll see that the workpiece or the reference model of the bracket exercise P3 is going to stick through the stock model that we're cutting. So as we're cutting this pocket here, yeah, exactly. You can see that we are, are getting this red showing through. That's the workpiece. I can toggle that on and off. But that workpiece is the reference uh, bracket exercise P3 that we brought in. And it's actually a little bit too close to that radius value if we're only leaving 15 thousandths on the wall and the floor. So again, that's why I use that rule of thumb number where I take the size of that radius divided by two, and that's going to put us in a pretty good point of where we were, will not intersect with that radius value if we're trying to rough it out with a sharp or square tool. So I'll go back here into the parameters. I'm gonna re-update this to the 0 0.03125, and I'll do the same thing for the floor, and then I will let that toolpath regenerate with those values.
So now that we've updated that six toolpath to rough out these windows without overcutting those four radii, let's go ahead and take a look at the seventh toolpath, which is going to be a finishing operation and try to update this with the quarter inch bullnose end mill, which shouldn't be any issue because it's a little bit smaller than that 5 16 or that 312 end mill that we were just trying to rough out these pockets with this toolpath. So I'm going to click on the seventh toolpath here. And just like we were talking about before, when we were looking at the uh, toggle visibility between P2 and P3, those pockets are just going to be a little bit too deep. So we're going to have to re-update the Z depth values. And then we're also going to try to update this with the new geometry or in theory that new geometry for P3. So I'm going to click on the seventh toolpath, open or expand that out. I'm going to click on the parameters here. And like I was saying before, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to show off a bad example. But let's say the pocket windows, the geometry did get updated going from P2 to P3. In fact, it really didn't, but I'm going to show you what would happen if it did. I'm going to deselect, remove the selected chains here, and then we're going to reselect these chains. And just like what we were doing with the last step where we were trying to chain from solid chains and we were using edges, we're just going to use that exact same uh, workflow where we're going to hold down the shift key. We're going to select on the top edge of that radius so we can include the entire window. And we just want to make sure that the selection is going counterclockwise. So I'm going to select on this top edge of this radius. And again, we're getting that nice uh, tangent loop or that tangent chain all, all the way around that top edge of that radius. And we see that it's going counterclockwise by the green arrow. We're going to follow suit with these two smaller windows as well, or these two smaller pockets. I'll hold down the shift key and we'll go counterclockwise here. And then we'll also go counterclockwise here. And again, this looks like a great selection. We can go ahead and hit the green check mark. And I'm just showing you as a bad example, if it did need to get updated from P2 to P3, this is how you would do it. However, if you were still referencing that old P2 model for these window sizes, nothing really had to change. We're just going to go ahead and update the tool as as well as the depth and top of stock values and linking parameters. So I'm going to jump over here into the tool tab. I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to find a 250 bullnose end mill that's going to be the 14th tool. We're going to use this for the finishing operation. When I select that tool, I'm going to right click and from the drop down menu, I'm going to choose reinitialize speeds and feeds to update the speeds and feeds value. Likewise, I'm just going to re-update this comment or this note here. And I'm going to say this is going to be a 250 bullnose end mill, and it's still a finished pocket detail. And then we'll just go ahead and uh, come down here to the linking parameters. And inside of linking parameters, we just have to reassociate the top of stock as well as the depth. So top of stock should be negative 0.0625. So I'm going to go ahead and select on one of these top edges for that first step. And the same thing here for the depth. We'll click on the depth there and we'll select on one of these bottom edges of that floor radius. And we can see that gets updated to a value of negative 0.1875 or negative 3 16 So nothing else should really change here. We can go ahead and hit the green check mark and see how this toolpath gets regenerated. And like we were doing before, I'm just going to move my red arrow down beneath this pocket that we just updated. And then I'm going to select the toolpaths one through seven and just run this and verify. So I'm just going to move my arrow down one so that I include this pocket here. And I'll click on the first toolpath in the uh, operation here. And I'll hold down the shift key and then I'll select on the seventh toolpath. And that way I have all the toolpaths that I've updated. And then I'll just run this and verify. We're going to click on this half pipe looking icon from the top row above your operations manager. And and we will still leave the workpiece on and I'm going to leave my stock transparent so I can see if I'm over or undercutting some of these values in the radii, uh, sorry, the floor radii. So I'll hit play and let this run out here. We can clearly see that we're doing this roughing operation, finishing, and now we're doing roughing and then finishing for that first step. And now we're going to start to take a look at the uh, pocket details. So this is that roughing operation with the flat end mill. And now we're going to use the bullnose end mill, that quarter inch bullnose end mill with the uh, radius of 0 0.0625 to cut out the uh, floor of the pocket. So again, we don't see any differences between the stock model and what is being cut. So this looks like a great finishing operation for that pocket detail. I'm really happy with this quarter inch bullnose end mill. And we're going to say that we're pretty much done with the first operation and updating it to the P3 model because the next two toolpaths are just drilling operations, which are exactly the same. So I'm going to back out of verify here. And I'm actually just going to move my arrow down here beneath nine. So I'm just going to click down on the red arrow and just go down beneath my ninth toolpath. And I'm going to say that first operation is complete for updating uh, bracket exercise P3. 
Now, just like what we talked about in the last video, we do have toolpath in this first operation that is tied to the second operation because we created this stock model and it's trying to reference toolpath that we have changed or updated. So we currently see that the stock model or the first toolpath in the second operation is currently set to a dirty operation or it needs to get regenerated because we have an X over that stock model icon. So we're just gonna click on this stock model icon. It's the first toolpath in the second operation. And we're going to rebuild or regenerate this to the updated toolpath that we just took a look at. So up here in the top of the operations manager, we're going to click on this third icon in the first row. Again, it's a tool sticking out of a collet, sticking out of a spindle with a little green play button next to it. So I'm going to click on that regenerate all selected operations. And this is going to take a second to load, but it's going to regenerate all this tool path and then reproject it against that stock model that we were creating for second operation. And we can clearly see that this is a one-to-one -one representation of what we updated to the bracket exercise P3. So this looks really great to me. However, we need to start addressing the elephant in the room, and I'm sure most of us are thinking this, but what are we going to be doing with the second operation? Because when we were looking at the bracket exercise P1 and P2, all we did for second operation was we created a stock model, and then we projected a face mill to the back side so that we could mill it flat. But when we're going from P2 to P3, we saw in the blueprints and even on this 3D model that we're trying to actually mirror this entire top side with all the steps and pockets to the back side for second operation. So there's really three ways that we can go about doing this. The first is we could go and recreate all this geometry and repick all these pockets, which would be pretty tedious. The second method that we could use is called Toolpath Transform. And it's located here inside the Toolpaths tab in the top ribbon. So if you click on this Toolpaths tab up here, it's actually going to be located right here near the right hand side. It's called Toolpath Transform. And if you click on that icon, it allows you to either translate, rotate, or mirror specific toolpaths. However, I'm not the biggest fan of this when you're going from one operation to another. So in this instance, we're going from first operation to second operation, and I don't want to link all these toolpaths to the second operation because inside a second operation, let's say I have to make a change on a specific toolpath, maybe I need to update the tool, or maybe I need to add another spring pass. Well, I would have to do that at the first operation level, and then that would effectively change the program for first operation. So I want to separate these going from first operation to second operation, so I'm not the biggest fan, again, of using this toolpath transform going between those operations. So I'm going to say no to this. I'm actually going to X out of this toolpath transform. And then the third method, which is my preferred method, is actually just to copy and paste the toolpaths that we want to use and take them from first operation and then just paste them into second operation. And once they're in second operation, we're just going to update the WCS C and T planes for each one of those toolpaths so that we can rotate them around in second op. So I'm going to take a look at these toolpaths over here, and we've already identified the ones that we're going to be using for the step in the pocket, and we're just going to end up copying that and pasting it over to second op. So if we can see over here on the left-hand side in our operations manager, that's going to be the fourth toolpath, that's going to be the fifth toolpath, that's going to be the roughing and finishing for that first step, and then it's going to be the sixth toolpath, and then the seventh toolpath, and that's roughing and finishing for these pockets. So I know that I'm going to take four through seven, and then I'm going to copy those and then paste them into second operation. So let's go ahead and rotate around to the second op, uh, top, which is going to be down here in the planes tab. So I'm going to go inside the planes and then I'm going to change my orientation here to the WCS C and T for the second op top. I'm going to then right click out here in the viewport and from the drop down menu, I'm going to choose isometric. So I'm rotating around to the second operation and then I'm going to go back into my toolpaths tab and we already identified what toolpaths we're going to take. So that's going to be four. I'm going to hold down the shift key and I'm going to select everything in between all the way up to seven. So again, that's four through seven. That's going to be roughing and finishing for the first step and then the pockets. And then as long as I have a check mark next to each one of these toolpaths, I'm going to right click on one of them and from the drop down menu here, I'm going to select copy. So I'll select copy right here. And then this is very important. You want to make sure that your red arrow is in the correct location. So we actually want to move this red arrow to the bottom of the toolpath group for second operation. So I'm going to move all the way up here to the icons above the operation manager. And I'm going to click on the red arrow down until it's at the bottom of that second operation toolpath group. So I'm going to click a couple times here until I see that red arrow at the bottom of second operation. And again, we've copied these toolpaths to the clipboard. So I'm going to right click to the right of the red arrow. Again, make sure that it's at the bottom of your second operation toolpath group. So I'm going to right click to the right of the arrow. And then from this drop down menu, you're going to select paste. So we're going to paste that toolpaths or paste those toolpaths into second operation from first operation. 
Now, this might be a little confusing at first, but you should see those four through seven toolpaths now copied into the second operation. And all we're gonna do to update this is I'm going to go into this 12th toolpath. This should be the roughing operation for that first step. So I'm gonna come in here into the parameters. And then all we wanna do is we wanna come down here into our planes. And inside the planes tab, we can currently see that the working coordinate system, the tool plane, and then the construction plane are all set to first op top. So let's see what happens when we update this to the second op top. So I'm gonna click on this icon here for select WCS plane. So we'll click on that. And then from this drop down selection, we're going to scroll down until we see our second op top. I'll select on that second op top plane. I'll hit the green check mark. And then if I wanna copy the second op top plane to the tool plane and then the construction plane, it's very easy. We're just gonna hit this little fast forward button. It's going to copy to the tool plane. So I'll click this once. And then I'm gonna move over here to the construction plane. I'll click on that and it's going to copy it again to the construction plane. And now I've effectively updated that tool path for the roughing operation of that first step to change the WCS, the C and the T plane to the second op top. So let's see what happens when we hit the green check mark and regenerate this tool path. And to me, that looks like we're now projecting that toolpath to the back side of the part or for second op top. So I wanna see what this looks like in Verify before we follow suit through the other toolpaths. So in the left-hand side in our Operations Manager, I'm going to single out the stock model, the facing, and then that 2D dynamic mill that we just updated for the first step on the back side for second op top. So I'm gonna click on this 10th toolpath. I'm gonna to hold down the Shift key, and then I'm going to click on the 12th toolpath all the way up to that 2D dynamic mill. And then up here in the icons above the toolpath operation manager, we're going to click on the verify icon. It's that half pipe looking icon here. And this is going to open this model up here in verify. And just like we've done before in previous second op uh, verifies, I'm just going to turn on my fixtures here to see how this relates. And then I'm going to slow this down a little bit, but we'll go ahead and play this out. And we can see that we did that face mill. And now we can see that this new 2D dynamic mill that we projected to the backside of the part or for the uh, second op top is actually projecting the way that we want it to. So I think we were successful in copying and pasting this and then changing the WCS, the C and the T planes to be used for second op top. So let's go ahead and back out of Verify and then just follow the same workflow for the other toolpaths that we copied and pasted in. So let's take a look at this 13th toolpath. This was going to be the finishing operation for that first step using the quarter inch bullnose end mill. So I'm gonna go in here into the parameters of that 13th toolpath. And just like what we did before, we're gonna come down here into the planes tab. So click on planes. And then we currently see that this is first op top for the WCS, C and the T planes. So I'm gonna update this with this icon right here. We're gonna change it from the first op top. We're gonna to look for a second op top, hit the green check mark, and then we're just going to copy it to the tool plane, and then we're just going to copy it to the construction plane. And again, you can see that that tool path is projecting on the bottom side of the part that's going to be your first op top, but when we hit the green check mark, this is now going to re-project this onto the top side or the back side in this instance for second op top. So again, we can just double check and see what this looks like inside of Verify. So inside the second op uh, toolpath group, I'm gonna click on that stock model, hold down the shift key and go all the way down here to that 13th tool, tool path, which was the finishing operation that we just updated. So I'm clicking on 10 through 13. And then in the icons above the operation manager, I'm gonna click on verify. And I'm gonna see what this looks like when we run this again. So this is going to load out here. We'll go ahead and play this. And again, we have that face mill. We have this roughing operation. And then again, if we did this correctly and we updated that WCS CNT, we should see a finishing operation using that quarter inch bullnose end mill. So we're just finishing up this roughing operation and hopefully the next tool path is going to project the way that we want it to. And look at that, it's exactly what we want. This is gonna be the finishing operation from first op now projected to second op. So let's go ahead and speed this up. And we can see that completes the first step for the second op, so the backside of the part. And again, we're just going to follow suit with the next tool path. So I'm gonna back out of here and a verify. And then we're gonna do the exact same thing to the roughing and the finishing tool path. So the last tool tool paths that we copied from first operation to second operation for the pocket details on the backside of the part. So I'm gonna look at this 14th tool path down here in the second operation. I'm gonna click on the parameters 
And again, we're just going to move down here into the planes tab. Inside of planes, I'm just going to update the WCS, the C and the T planes. So I'm going to change this from first op top, scroll down, change it to second op top, hit the green check mark, copy, copy. We've updated the WCS, C and the T. We'll hit the green check mark. And I'm not going to check this again and verify until we update the last toolpath, but I'll do the exact same thing here to the finishing toolpath, which is going to be this 15 toolpath. It's this is pocket mill here. So I'm going to click on the parameters for that 15 toolpath. Again, we're just going to move down here into planes. Inside of planes, I'm going to update the WCS, the C, and the T. So I'm going to change this to the second op top from first op top. So I'm going to click on second op top, green check mark, copy, copy. And then again, if we hit the green check mark, this should now project the roughing and the finishing uh, tool paths for those pocket mills onto the back side of the part or now the top side for second op top. So now that we've updated all these toolpaths that we copied and pasted from first operation and a second operation, let's see what the entire second operation toolpath group looks like when we run it and verify. So over here on the left-hand side of my operations manager, I'm now going to click on the second op toolpath group. So I'm gonna click on second op. I should see a check mark next to all of these toolpaths. And then up here in the top icons above the operation manager, I'm gonna click on the verify selected operations. And again, we're just going to play this all out. So these are all the toolpaths from second op. And we're just gonna hit the play button here. And we can see that we face milled it. We're doing the roughing. And then we're gonna move into finishing for that first step. I'll speed this up a little bit. And then we're gonna be doing these pocket mills. So we roughed it and then we finished it. And just as a quick double check, I am going to toggle on my workpiece. I'm going to change my stock model here to transparent. And if I zoom in here, I can see again, there is no deviation on the second op. So even just copying those toolpaths from first op to second op and just changing the WCS, the C and the T planes was completely successful. So I'm really happy with what we did with those toolpaths. We basically made this a couple of clicks, just a copy and paste and then changing those WCS, C and T planes. And we were able to complete an update second op very efficiently. So I'm going to say that this is done. We've completed updating second operation and I'm going to move back into the master cam model and then again, just as a quick note, you want to make sure that you're going to file and that you don't save this because that would save over P2, but you actually want to select save as, and you're going to name this bracket exercise P3. And this again will complete the advanced revision management inside of Mastercam going from P2 to P3. And again, as I mentioned in the previous video when we were covering basic revision management, I hope that you can gain an appreciation for how much work and effort we put in the previous steps, making sure that our files are robust and making sure that our toolpaths are easily updated because there's a lot of value in being efficient and being able to handle these revisions quickly. And while this was quite a bit more work going from P1 to P2 and then P2 to P3 with the advanced revision management, it was more or less just us understanding what tools we had available to us and then how we could manipulate the tool paths that we had created. So that being said, I hope that this was of value to you. Thanks for watching and I'll go ahead and catch you in the next one. Bye.